morning again. Good morning. Thank you, Timmy. Good morning. Thank you, Matt. All right. Um, as we come towards an end, uh, and today is going to be a day of finishing up the sermon series that we started in the fall, Rhythms for Rootedness, Ancient Practices for Spiritual Living, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We'll start there today. Genesis 1, okay? I want to read the end of Genesis 1, verses 27 through verse 31, and I'll read the first three verses of Genesis 2, and this will be the, the shape, the structure, the skeleton for where we'll spend our time today. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. That's the end of the creation story, as you may know it from Genesis 1. Chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, done, complete, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. That's the very beginning of the story of God and the story of his people that we just read. And at the end of this story, there's this dance and rhythm and balance that we are clued into right out of the gate. Six days of work, <laughs> creating, right, having purpose, having meaning, and then a sacred day of rest for blessing, for joy, for celebrating completion, things being done. We're told three times in two verses from all the work that God had done that he rested. Friends, nothing has changed from that time. Right? Nothing has changed. For your spiritual health, work hard for the Lord and rest well with the Lord. So I want that's the main idea of today. Work hard for the Lord six days, rest well with the Lord for one day. This is the last sermon in our sermon series, Rhythms for Rootedness, that we've been in this fall. And we're putting our last pairing, work and rest together into one sermon rather than having two like we've been going through for this series. And we've gone back to the very beginning of the story because so many of these rhythms that we've walked through actually have their roots in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. By the way, so much of life following Christ you can find in the first three chapters of Genesis. All the goodness of it and the brokenness of life too. You find it all <laughs> in the first three chapters of Genesis. Know it. Dive deeply into those passages. But we've covered eight rhythms, six and then two more today, eight rhythms that we've been looking at this fall. And as we've gone through these rhythms, we've been trying to pair with it. Here's the spiritual benefit for you. Here's why this is good for the health of your soul, rather than just have these things be rites or traditions or routines or disciplines that we feel like we have to do. We've been trying to give like a window into it. Here's why this is good for you. All right. So some of this is going to be a reminder. It should be on the screen. This is the order that we've done them in this fall. Feasting. And the primary benefit that that does for you is it helps you remember God. What he has done in the past. So you can hold on to faith in that and share faith in that. Then we went to fasting. It's opposite. Feasting and fasting. And feasting or fasting helps you pray, but pray earnestly to God. <coughs> then we talked about community. A critical thing to help you remain faithful. Because you can't live a life of faithfulness to Jesus in isolation. 
So you need community to live faithfully. Solitude is a rhythm and a journey to help you experience God and be with him. Speaking and listening put together is rhythms that help you communicate with God. And then today, work, which is going to help you find purpose and meaning for your life in God, and rest, which is going to help you enjoy God. Right, so these are the rhythms that we've looked at. Those are kind of the whys before that. So we're going to look at work and rest together. I'll do my best to put two sermons into one, and then we'll wrap up and close, like kind of just tie it up on the, the whole of the series as well. Good? That's your three points for the outline today, by the way. Pretty simple. Work, rest, and then the rhythms for rooting the series wrap up. That's kind of what we'll talk about. Ready to go? Yeah. Let's do it, and yes, so I'm going to go. All right, work. We'll start with work. What most of us think of as the grind, right? That five or six days a week, you go to a job site, or you're working in your home, you're working to get a paycheck, or you're working to just serve others and pour your lives out for those around, around us. Some of us dread work, and you live for the weekend, right? Some of us dream of retirement when we're going to stop working. Others of us enjoy our work. We feel gifted at it. It's like what we were made to do. We like it. We're good at it. But here's the essence of today. And I'll move through some of these things fairly quickly. The essence is humans, as we see in Genesis 1 and 2, humans are meant to, designed for, need to work. It's just part of how God has made us. We weren't created to just consume. We were created to cultivate and create like God does, to labor, to work at it. Yes, God created it all, but then he invites each and every one of us into the job of cultivating it all and building upon that creation that God had started with things like rule it, have dominion over it, subdue it, be fruitful, multiply. God has now invited us into the story of work and what he was doing. And originally, before Genesis 3, this was a really good thing. In fact, Genesis 1 closes with, it was very good. And here's the hope of the gospel, by the way, is we're going to get back to that some point when the work is really good. But before we get there, like, I think what it's going to feel like is like, do you guys know that, I don't know why this is so satisfying, but when you find the right puzzle piece and it just kind of like clicks in, you're like, oh, perfect. It, Maybe that's just like, I get a little rush out of finding that perfect puzzle piece and like, it just snaps in. I think in the fullness of time, that's what work is going to feel like for us. It just feels like it fits and it brings so much joy. That was what we had in Genesis 1 and 2. It's what we're going to be getting back to thanks to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who will restore all things. But in this in-between time, because that lasted only so little time, because sin entered and distorted the goodness of work. So it's what you and I know far more often is work marked by toilsome, futility, meaninglessness, it's cursed, it's hard, it's backbreaking, far more of those things than it is joy and purpose and meaning and blessedness and all of those things. It, those things, it feels like right now, you ever feel like you try to jam a puzzle piece in that doesn't quite fit? Like, oh, good enough, get the hammer. That's kind of maybe what it feels like a little bit more right now. But what now? Is all hope lost? Is work just a damned but necessary reality? For today, knowing we have to move fairly quickly through some of these things, here's where I would just like us to get to and have it for today. Because for the goodness of your soul, rootedness, health, to quiet despair, to quiet anxiety, the futility, the stress of things, here's what I would love to help us all arrive at. Can you connect your work, whatever that is, can you connect your work to God's kingdom plans? Right? And see that connection so that you have a sense of purpose for what you're giving your life to and how you're spending your days. For a moment, I'm going to brag on Nicole. She's not going to like this. She didn't know I wanted to do this. All right. All right, just for a second. But Sometime in October, it was a week, it was pharmacy week. So appreciate your pharmacist week in October. Something, right? Yeah. Anyway, Nicole did a bunch of stuff for the staff that she has at the hospital. At the end of the week, Nicole got cards back from her staff members. 
and they wrote thank you notes. But here was what was really beautiful about that, is that in the thank you notes, you, this is Nicole's words here, so forgive me, but um, there was a clear sense that they were capturing the culture of the pharmacy she was trying to create and build. Right? And that was super exciting. She found in those thank you notes that her employees were enjoying their work because they could see the purpose and how it connected to the bigger vision and idea of what they were trying to do for the whole hospital. You get what I'm saying there? Right? That speaks well of Nicole's leadership. That's kind of the thing I wanted us to connect to, that they're enjoying their work because they saw its connection to the bigger picture. We have the same thing before us as it relates to our work in God's kingdom. I think this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to get at in Colossians 3. Oh, did I get this one in there, Margo? Yeah, so Colossians, Colossians 3, verse 23 and 24. Whatever you do, whatever, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Whatever you do, work hard at it. Because you're serving our Lord in that. So for all of us today, as we consider our work, what we give the majority of our waking moments to, our lives towards, first thing, can you connect your work to God's kingdom? Right? As I look around this room, I see people who build things and make things. That's awesome. Because God makes things and builds things and wants things built for the good of his people. I see people who educate people. That's a beautiful gift to humanity, to educate them. That is God's good work. I see people who help heal people, whether that's physically or mentally or social, uh, social work, all caring for people. I see people who feed people. We have a baker. The delight of baking stuff. Like connect these things to God's goodness for his people and bringing people joy, whether it's stewarding creation as an engineer or a, a ranger, or I don't know, anything, like people who raise little people, <laughs> whatever you do, do you see how it connects to God's good designs and purposes for his life? The goodness of humanity. If you can do that and see how your work is a part of that plan, boy, there's an element of like, I'm taking part in building God's kingdom and pushing back darkness. Do that. Find that. Figure that out for you so you have purpose and meaning for your life. But the second thing is uh, important as well, because whatever your work may be, you probably have some people around you. Right? I know some of us work remotely, but you're still interacting with people in some way. And like that passage from Colossians, Colossians that you work for the Lord, not men, you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know this about our Savior, is that he cares far more about people than he does project or task. Right? So as you go into your office, as you go into your schools, as you go into your homes or nursery rooms or whatever, as you go, make disciples. Whatever your job is, or wherever it is, your work, your home, is a place of mission. Right? Uniquely designed and carved out for you. So, if you can connect your task to God's kingdom, if you can serve the people around you in your job as his ambassador, and you can see those things and have vision and purpose with those things, whatever your work is can have meaning. And when your work has meaning, you can rest. And take a breath and be content. Because you're giving your life to our king in a good way. Right? So speaking of rest, we'll move to that. Because work is not all that we were designed for. We were created in his image, we're told. And so he works and creates, and so should we. But we also see in that story that God rests and enjoys, and so should we. And so for your spiritual health, for rootedness, for growth, for maturity, we need to rest. Or in the parlance of the Bible or in the language of the Bible, we'll say to take a Sabbath. Right? Work hard for six days and rest well for the day. And that pattern on repeat over and over and over again, we should never tire from. So as I talk about this, I want to just hit on four things. Why? Why rest? Why Sabbath? Barriers to it. Why don't we do this? Right? Intentionality with it and ideas for it. All right? 
Good with that? Okay. Why? Why is this regular, frequent, one in seven type of days of rest important? And I think we can get this right from Genesis to start. I'll reread chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, where we are told that God rests. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy or sacred or set apart. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So the first thing, I have two reasons as to why. Excuse me. The first one is God set it apart. God made it holy. God blessed it. And if you can't continue on with the biblical narrative, and we just don't have the time to do this today, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy would be one of the Ten Commandments. It would be commanded to his people to one in every seven days be a day of rest, to model his image, to be like him. And now, you can take that, and you can have strict dogmatic rules from what that's to look like, and there's been, that's happened with, where we have a tendency to do that as humans, is take these things that God invites us into or commands for us and make dogmatic aspects of it. But on this side of the cross in Jesus, we actually have tons of freedom as to how to express the Sabbath principle. But don't confuse freedom to express the principle with liberty to ignore it. Those are two different things. Right? So this still remains a command that the Lord has for his people. Right? Even on this side of the cross, even though we may have freedom as to how to express it, but we should still have this six to one ratio, or I think seven to one? I don't know, I'm not good at that. Six to one ratio of working. This weekly statement of humility, of taking a step back, of rest, of trust, of faith in the God who holds all things together. Right? It's a weekly statement that says, we are not the gods who have to hold all things together he is. And that is a gift for us to have that once a week. So the first thing, it's a sacred, set-apart, commanded day of our Lord. The second thing, and I'm moving fairly quickly, I know that, guys. But the second thing is, while it can be a command, don't miss that it's also a day of blessing. Right? So I'm going to read a passage from Isaiah 58. We started our sermon series with this passage. This is Isaiah 58, verses 11 and 12. So this may ring a bell for some of you. But in Isaiah 58, verses 11 to 12, it says this. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. When we read that at the beginning of the sermon series, remember, we were like, who doesn't want that? Like, those are promises of things that God will do. Satisfying desire in scorched places, making bone strong, watered garden. You won't fail. You'll be rebuilt. Your foundations will support many generations to come. You're a repairer of the breach, a reconciler of broken things. Like, this is beautiful stuff. But do you guys remember the 10 verses that preceded this dealt with one of our other rhythms? Do you remember which one that was? Fasting. The 10 verses before this all were all about our call and invitation into fasting. And then we get this on the other side. If you do this, then God will do this. Right? But there's another thing on the other side of this. Okay? So we love that this is like a sandwich a little bit. Right? And we name sandwiches based on what's in the middle. Right? Turkey, meatball, whatever. We don't name sandwiches for the bread. Typically, do we have any sandwich? Is that true of any sandwich? Most, I'm not going to say, I don't know definitively, but most of the time we name the sandwich for what's in the middle. So what's in the middle is verses 11 and 12. These beautiful promises of God. But there's two slices of bread. One is fasting. Here's where verse 13 continues to go. All right, so here's verses 13 and 14. If you turn, your, turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. So if you turn back from doing your pleasure on his holy day, and you call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord, and you make it honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, 
or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly. Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you in the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The two pieces of bread are fasting and Sabbath, which are two rhythms that really require us to step back. And then we get the meat in the middle of what the Lord does on our behalf. Right? If you honor the Sabbath, if you delight in it, if you make it a day not about your delights, your pleasures, your hobbies, but his delights, then you will delight in him. And the Sabbath will be a blessing to you. Why Sabbath? It's a commanded, sacred, holy day. And it's a blessing for you. It is good for you. It's a delight. Why not? I'm sure we could sit here today and fill up some more time on why perhaps some of us don't practice the Sabbath. Right? But here's a couple. Fear. If I don't do this, it's not going to get done. Can't take a day off. I can't just step back and rest. We've all been there, right? Yep. That's one. Another one is, I think we, I don't know if we would say it, but I think we live it out. We just value doing and producing something rather than just being and enjoying something. Psalm 127 puts a correction before us when it says, It's in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for the Lord gives to his beloved rest. You can keep working, but it can ultimately be in vain. Another one might be uh, caught in the cultural moment. We just live in a busy, 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 busy noisy, 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 notification, buzz, buzz, world. Right? Noise, work, hobbies, distract us, numb us, cover up maybe what God wants to be saying or having for us. We're just caught in this moment. We have so much information, so much before us, so much work that we think we have to do in our cultural moment. Another one might just be as simple as we don't know how. We don't know how to say it. It's new to us. Right? We might be familiar with a day off or a vacation. Right? But that's not the same thing as Sabbath, which is where we're going to move through here for a little bit. A day off from work is not the same thing as what the Bible puts before us as Sabbathing. Like, this was like feasting. When we talked about feasting, remember we said, this isn't just about enjoying a meal and having a feast. This is about putting intentionality with the meal so that the food and the participation in community around food and feasting draws you to remember God. You have to lay a layer of intentionality into your traditions and feasts to make it what the Bible wants it to be for you. Same here. You have to layer intentionality into a day off and rest to make it what the Bible wants it to be for you as a Sabbath. With me? Okay. Because the point of a regular, consistent rhythm of rest from work isn't just time off from the busyness of work to exchange it for the busyness of hobbies. Or something else. It's to slow down, to take a breath, to rest, and have intentionality with God. And this intentionality with a day off, I think, is the most overlooked thing as it relates to the Sabbath, which is going to quickly get us to ideas for how to Sabbath. Things that we can weave into days off to have intentionality. At the very beginning of the sermon series, too, we paused because we listed the eight out. And I had every one of us kind of say, which one do you feel like you're naturally more inclined to? Or maybe you have better practices and rhythms with already. And which ones maybe you have weaker, I don't know what that is, or I don't really practice that. So we all had a chance just to kind of examine that. If I'm honest with you, this one is probably the lowest on my list as I looked at the eight. So just this idea of resting and Sabbathing. But I also want to say that and say one other thing. I know a few people who have thought as deeply about the rhythm of Sabbath and had various points in times in their life, different seasons and practices than the Schwartz family with the idea of Sabbath. And so in a small group to this whole sermon series, one of the things, and you can get a high five, Charlie, I'll give it to you. Um, small group through this series, one of the things we've been asking as a question in our booklet is like, who do you know that might practice this rhythm well and what can you learn from them? They're here. Ask them today. Put you guys on the spot a little bit. Of their, I know they've thought about this a lot and they practice it well not every season but they've practiced it well in the seasons so I asked Matt earlier this week can you give me some ideas 
So here's some of Matt's ideas. Okay? Just been saying, uh oh. Okay. On a day off that you want to consider a Sabbath, can you find 30 minutes, carve that 30 minutes out, and try one of three things? Have focused time with God. Prayer or reading the scripture would be great ways to spend 30 minutes once a week. I know we're busy sometimes during the workday, but can a day off on Sabbath have a focused time with God? Or a focused time with a family member or a friend, serving them or praying them, praying with them or for them, or a focused time on a task or a hobby that you enjoy, just to take the light in what you like to enjoy in the world around you, right? So one thing to try to put into a Sabbath is not just taking a day off, but putting, car out 30 minutes, focus on God, focus on a family member or a friend, or focus on a task or a hobby. Here's one that might cut a little bit. Sabbath box, which when I saw that in a text from my God, what's a Sabbath box? It's a box to put your technology gadgets in for 24 hours. That might be something a lot of us need. Put off technology for 24 hours and take a break from it. Sabbath box. Here's another one. At the front end of the Sabbath, whether it's the night before or whenever you start right before it, take 15, 20 minutes and write down everything that you don't want to stop doing. A to-do list, your worries, your fears, the things you're not sure are going to like hold until 24 hours later. Write those things down. Pray through it. Hand it over to God. Close the journal. Set the paper aside and walk away. But get it out of your head and just write it down. And then be good with letting it go for 24 hours and allow God to hold it. I think you even mentioned lighting a candle as part of that. Don't burn it. <laughs> or don't, don't let the candle burn it. But light a candle and then rest. You've given it over to God and you can take a break. Right, so write those things down. Another one, go to church. Gather with God's people. Sing. Read scripture. Pray together. And then the last one, enjoy a good meal. Enjoy a good meal and feast. Bring in the intentionality of feasting into the good meal and remember what God has done for your week past. And maybe even pray for what you want God to do in the week ahead. Those are some ways to spend a Sabbath. And I think with time, having this over and over and over again as a habit and a rhythm, this is one of the things I got from Pastor Tori this week and talking to him as well from Troy. When you get into this consistent pattern of this Sabbath, what you start to feel the shift from is that you don't need a day of rest to get away from work. You actually start to enter work from a place of rest. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the aim. I think of a regular rhythm of six days of work and one day of rest. And that's it. That's it for the Rhythms of Root in this series. We had eight rhythms we looked at. As we already looked at, you put those back up, Margo, I think. There's eight of them. They were in four. Seemingly opposite pairs, feasting and fasting, community and solitude, listening and speaking, working and resting. You guys remember why we put them in opposite pairs like this? What our inspiration was? What's that? The apple tree. The apple tree. Yeah, the nature. Taking our cues from nature around us, specifically the apple tree. And how an apple tree needs about 2,000 hours a year in dormancy in order to be healthy for the long haul. It needs the verdancy, the warmth, the sun, the abundance of summer, and it needs the cold and the harshness and the lack of winter. Same, same is true for us in our spiritual lives. Right? Oak trees would be the same thing. So much in nature as we look around us and needs this tension of both and. And so being inspired by how God has created all things, rhythms for us are healthy too that pull us in both directions. It's not lost on me. I don't know if it's, I doubt it's lost on you guys too, that our last sermon series as a church family is called Rhythms for Readings. In a season which I know for many of us feels like it it's a season of being uprooted and plucked up. And our last sermon series is called Rhythms for Rootedness. God's sovereignty and his providence never seem to amaze me, never cease to amaze me. I think it's timely. 
that he has us in this sermon series. In the first sermon series, uh, the first sermon in this series, I shared this idea as it paired with the main idea of the whole sermon series, which, do you guys remember the main idea for this sermon series? Annie's not here to read from my notebook, so you guys are stuck. And I didn't put this in the slide. And Tanner's not here. The main idea for our sermon series. Sarah's looking back in her notes, too. <laughs> Keep going, John. Sure, we'll go. We're going to return to, remain in, and repeat ancient, time-tested spiritual practices so that we can push deeper roots into Christ. That was the aim of our sermon series. And these are simple practices in some way. These simple spiritual rhythms that have tons of depth that God has created for us, for all of his people, and he's invited us in to live these things out for a lifetime. We never actually graduate from these rhythms. It should be in our lives all the time to continue to mature and grow in Christ's likeness. And one of the things I said in the first sermon series that these rhythms can be a real benefit and a, and a good for us is here's the thing we all know. Because life in a moment turns. Right? And we didn't see something coming, and it came. And things get uprooted. We're surprised. Life is totally uncertain in a lot of ways. But the beauty, the gift, the sweet things about regular rhythms in our lives like this is we can plan them, we can set them, we can keep returning to them, and they can be certain things in our lives that regardless of the circumstances around us can reconnect us to a constant God. Life is going to change. Life is going to ebb and flow. Life is going to surprise you. But keeping these rhythms in your life through all seasons, no matter what season you find yourselves in, these consistent things can help you reconnect to a constant God in and through all seasons. Return to these things. Remain in them. And repeat them. And so for that, I'm grateful the Lord has us. Closing with a series like this. Brothers and sisters, keep engaging these rhythms. Right? Feast often. And remember him and his goodness toward you. Fast often. To demonstrate earnest prayer towards the Lord. Remain in community. Please remain in community. Don't isolate from community. Don't be in community isolated. Remain in community so that you can continue to move towards more and more faithfulness to what Jesus wants for you. Get yourself into solitude and silence so you can experience it. Speak, pray, listen, read the word, get in nature, keep communicating with our Lord. Work as unto the Lord for his kingdom and rest so that you can enjoy him. Keep following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's been a joy to point you to him for the last 10 years of my life. Remember, next week, when we gather, as our final gathering, it is going to be a Sunday of gratefulness and thanksgiving and giving your voice as testimony to that. So please come next Sunday with ways that you are grateful, things that you are thank thankful for that the Lord has done in and through this church. Come with those things next Sunday. Your voices will be central to next Sunday. Okay? Be lots of space given to you guys to speak and speak of what the Lord has done. Matt and the band can come back up. We'll shift to something that we've done every Sunday, and that is step into communion or the Lord's Supper. And so just to get our eyes back on Jesus and the beauty of his gospel and how this work-rest balance plays out, like Jesus incarnated, God himself stepped into human flesh, and he worked his butt off for 33 years, specifically for three years. Like, worked his butt off doing the Lord's will. And when his work is finished, as he's hanging on the cross, he literally says, it is finished. All the work the Father had for him was done. And on the other side of that phrase, on the other side of the cross, he was welcomed into and entered into his Father's rest eternally. And because of that, we get that gift 
we get to enter that rest and we don't have to do the work. When Jesus says it is finished, he is speaking both of all the work that he had to do and any of the work that we might have had to do to enter into the Father's rest and enjoy his delight and his blessing. It's done for us. When Jesus said it is finished, it is finished for you as well. What a gift. So we don't have to work our butt off to get rest. We actually get rest and an invitation to go work for our Lord. What a gift the gospel is. That our God has done all the work for us. When you go back to communion today and receive it, I don't know who's serving communion today. Who wants to serve communion today? So you got it? Right? All right, when you go back to communion, receive the finished work of Christ. Rest in it. Delight in it. Then go into your week and work for him. We'll pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for being a God who blesses us with rest. Thank you for being a God who gives us lives to spend for your glory, and that's our good. Please help us connect our work to your kingdom, to your purposes, to your plans, to your designs. Come help us rest well. Enjoy you, delight in you. And thank you for the finished work of reconciling us to yourself. We couldn't have done it. We couldn't have worked hard enough for it, so we just thank you for that free gift. Help us to receive it well with joy today and go into this week celebrating and singing its good story. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.